Hello and welcome to News Click. The ADM Jabalpur case, seen as one of the most shameful incidents in the history of our Supreme Court, has now been explicitly overruled in the recently uh, concluded judgment in the Puttaswamy case. For our younger viewers, a bit of background on the ADM Jabalpur case. When emergency was declared in 1975, all opponents of the government were arrested under draconian provisions of preventive detention laws, known, for instance, as the Maintenance of Internal Security Act. Numerous petitions were filed by these detainees against these patently abusive arrests. Now, despite most high courts actually holding that the petitioners could challenge the detention even during emergency, the Supreme Court, in a 4-1 to decision, held that no such powers to approach a court existed during the period of emergency. Essentially, the Supreme Court suspended the writ of habeas corpus during this period. Today, we look back at the circumstances surrounding the ADM Jabalpur case and try and understand why the judgment in the Puttaswamy judgment is actually important. To discuss the matter, we're joined by Prabir Purkaista, who was jailed during emergency and therefore has a fair few stories to share with us. Welcome, Prabir. Now, you were arrested under Misa and detained in Tihar. What was the reason for your arrest? Well, as you yourself have said, Preventive detention meant that there was really no specific reason. It meant that the state feared that we might do something in the future and our current conduct was the reason why they had such apprehensions. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it was really uh, predicting the future and predictions of the future, as you know, are notoriously, uh, shall we say, uncertain. Mm -hmm. So, we were in Jawaharlal Nehru University and there was a resistance going on at the time against emergency. Mm -hmm. There were strikes, uh, one of the few strikes that took place during the university, uh, during the in, uh, emergency in the university mm -hmm. was in Jawaharlal Nehru University. I remember the second day of the strike, we were standing in front of the School of Languages, mm -hmm. which is one of the schools in Jawaharlal Nehru University and Menika Gandhi had come to attend her class mm -hmm. and Dev Prashat Tripathi who was the Students' Union President at the time and now the General Secretary of the NCP. He was there with me and was in Nani Mazumdar was also another student who was there with me. Three of us told her that there is a strike at the university and she should go back. So she went back. The consequence, I'm told, this is there in the Shah Commission hearings, is she went and told Sanjay Gandhi what kind of emergency is it. So when Binder, who was at that point of time, the DIG range, mm -hmm. and really looking after the emergency issues as it were, mm -hmm. not the normal policing issues. Right. So he used to go and meet Sanjay Gandhi every morning. So when he met Sanjay Gandhi, he said, mm -hmm. what, what is happening? So he came straight from the PM's house mm -hmm. and went into one of the police stations, which is Hodgkas police station, took one of the officer's cars over there mm -hmm. and came into the campus and literally kidnapped me in broad daylight mm -hmm. with other police constables and SH, you know, I think there was a DSP also involved and put me inside the car and took me to uh, another police station, mm -hmm. not the uh, police station, Hodgkas police station, right. I think took me to the Arkipuram police station. But what was the specific <coughs> or ostensible reason for your arrest? At well, that time? again, the, if you go to the history, mm -hmm. Pradipta Ghosh was the ADM who signed my visa warrant. Mm -hmm. He said there is nothing on record for me to sign this warrant. He delayed signing of the warrant. Again, this came out in the Shah Commission hearings. Uh, till he got a call from his boss, who was mm -hmm. a divisional commissioner, I think Nikhil Kumar at that point, uh, that was I think the person who was there, mm -hmm. saying the PM's house is involved, you will have to sign this. Right. And ADM uh, at that time of Delhi South, Pradipta Ghosh, testified in Shah Commission saying that he really signed it under duress. Right. So again, there was nothing at that point of time in the records to show that I could have done something. And even if they wanted to say that, there was nothing that they could produce on record. And that's why my detention under the Maintenance Inter of Internal Security Act was one of the cases that did come up in the Shah Commission because of this. So when it went before the courts, what specifically did the courts look at in terms of the various checks and balances in the law to prevent against its misuse? Was this ever even considered by the Supreme Court? Well, you know, let us be very honest. We were not people who were, who were schooled in law. Mm -hmm. Of course, the last 40 years, I guess, guess I have learned more about mm -hmm. law than I did at that point of time. So we were really listening to the arguments that were coming in, in the courts that does, do the courts have an ability to examine what the state or the government was doing and what the grounds on which our detention was being done were the grounds such that the detention could be 
uh, actually considered as preventive detention. Right. It wasn't arbitrary. Right. So therefore, the grounds could be there. Have, they could have judicial. There could be judicial scrutiny on the grounds of the detention, and that must be satisfied. I presume was the legal proposition yeah. that is being put before the court. Mm -hmm. Now. We were keenly uh, re, you know, reading the papers because mm -hmm. these proceedings were being reported in mm -hmm. the papers. They were not censored, they were being reported. And particularly the government's arguments were being reported in mm -hmm. great detail. Right. And I still remember Nirende answering uh, the, one of the judges that they, even if a constable shoots a person down, for persons uh, of enmity, reasons of Illegal enmity, reasons uh, uh, that is also not, uh, the courts have no locus on that, the courts cannot do anything about it. So this was perhaps the most extreme interpretation that mm. could have been given. The Rende later on says he wrote it, he, he said this in order for the courts to really uh, oppose what he was saying mm -hmm. and he was quite uh, unhappy at the fact the courts had ruled in the favour of this rather outrageous argument. But whether it's an afterthought by the Attorney General at that time there and there or it was something that he really what he thought, we don't know about that. Now at the time of emergency, you were jailed along with a whole lot of activists and politicians from a range of political parties. How, does, how did this decision actually affect all of you in jail, given that of course you didn't necessarily same, share the same political background either? See, of course jail does produce a camaraderie mm -hmm. during the period you are in jail which quite often ends outside the gates of the jail. So that is one. But obviously the fact that the judicial scrutiny going on was something we were hoping would work in our favor. And we were hoping and we felt that there was a good 50-50 possibility that the 3 to 2 verdict in the favor that there could be judicial scrutiny. We also were quite clear that the verdict could go against us but we thought the maximum it would be 2 to 3 verdict against us. So we're quite surprised to find that the courts had ruled four to one, and only Justice Khanna right. really stood up yeah. for what today and is being now claimed dissenting. Judge. Yeah, and it's claimed to be one of the three important judgments in the history of Indian mm -hmm. Supreme mm -hmm. Court, and uh, other being Fazil Ali, which is incidentally was also about preventive mm -hmm. detention. Union of India against Ego Gopal. Right. Yeah. Fazil Ali was the dissenting judgment. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other one was, of course, the Karak Singh judgment, right. which was the one you are talking about, the Puttuswami yeah. case, the privacy case. Yeah. And the third was uh, Justice uh, Khanna's dissenting judgment, the three great mm -hmm. dissenting judgments which are there. So we were disappointed the court had ruled against us, but we were more disappointed that the 4 to 1 judgment, right. which didn't speak well of the Supreme Court judges at that point of time. Now, why do you think that the Supreme Court actually, in a sense, and it went out of its way, to, to help the government out in this case. Because honestly, when you look at the prayers made by the government before the court, the court actually went beyond what the government was looking for in, 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 its, in its dicta. What, what, what do you think played a role in this sort of almost, ex, I mean, in, in this extension that the, the Supreme Court... You know, it's a very difficult question to answer because you're discussing about individuals and mm -hmm. what goes in their minds. But don't forget two of them who we had hoped would give a more positive judgment also mm -hmm. became uh, chief justices later. Mm -hmm. So I guess all of this, the chief justice, the judges are as prone to personal ambitions and other issues as any other community. So I wouldn't really go uh, into this in more detail because I don't think it's a legal issue. Mm -hmm. It was really a more personal issue. I don't think they acted out of fear. I don't mm -hmm. think that was the issue. But they certainly acted in a way which uh, would seem to indicate they put their personal ambitions ahead of what the judicial, uh, you know, conscience demanded. I must tell you one more mm -hmm. thing that happened as a consequence right. of the judgment. When the judgment went against the debt dues, we were in the hard jail. All the ones who had filed uh, habeas corpus mm -hmm. petitions were transferred out of the har. Right. We are under the plea that the har was overcrowded, mm -hmm. which it was, but that it always is, as you know. We are transferred to some of us to UP, for instance, and we are all put under solitary confinement, mm -hmm. starting some for four days, five days. In our case, we were eight of us were transferred to Agra Central Jail. We are put under solitary confinement for almost a month. Mm -hmm. So this seemed to also smack of petty vindictiveness right. of the government that they not only 
did uh, win the case, but after winning the case, they wanted to take petty revenge on the detainees, which challenged them. Right. Interestingly, there is another legal side right to this case that when I was transferred in Agra Central Jail mm -hmm. and we were in the solitary, so I really no work to do except read books. It mm -hmm. didn't take too much of time. So I decided to write what I thought would be the right uh, appeal, a habeas corpus petition challenging my transfer. Right. Now, I didn't know enough about law, which mm -hmm. I still don't, to not call it habeas corpus, but call it something else. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court, in its wisdom, decided because it was not habeas corpus, therefore they will not hear the petition. Right. They did not do what most uh, judges today go do, beyond go beyond the form and look at yeah. what was being challenged. It's also important to register that two of the judges who gave the judgment in favor of uh, the state, the government, actually apologized later and said that was a mistake, that judgment should not have been given. Bhagavati and Chandrachur, both of them actually are on record apologizing for their judgment. So I think that also should be now registered. No, uh, so now why I asked the previous question was do you feel that with the Puttaswamy judgment however that the Supreme Court is sort of re-establishing its institutional power independence, the fact that it is actually supposed to act as a check on governmental power and therefore setting aside a historical wrong. Why do you think that is important today? I think you're, you're quite right because they didn't have to do this yeah. because after the 44th amendment exactly. effectively this issue is over. Yeah. I think they're doing it as a signal mm -hmm. to themselves as well as to the country at large that they would protect henceforth the rights of the people against overarching uh, decisions of the government, to overreach of the government. Given what is happening in the country today, I think with the uh, lynchings that we are seeing, the mob violence which has been unleashed, the tacit connivance of the, gov the government in this, I am told that in Haryana, it is not just the mob violence, but even the police participates by shooting. Yeah. There is virtual emergency and no protection of the law. Uh, because the police are conniving exactly. fully with a mob violence. So it's a combination of state and mobs which mm -hmm. are doing its diktat. So given the situation, I think the courts are sending a signal that they would like to protect the rights of the people under such circumstances. So I do believe the privacy judgment as well as the triple talaq judgment, the way it's framed, mm -hmm. there is a worry in the court mm -hmm. regarding the governmental overreach, particularly with respect to personal freedoms. That's, I think, the reason they picked on the dissenting judgment and said that we need to correct this historical wrong. Mm -hmm. And Justice Khanna's judgment was a correct judgment in this case. Absolutely. And the Supreme Court was, in fact, scathing in its, in its comments about the, four, uh, the, the majority judgment in the ADM Jabalpur case. Now, as, as we've therefore seen, the Puttaswamy case has numerous facets to it and how we interpret our constitution and the civil liberties that citizens enjoy. I'm sure we will come back to the issue and the various threads that sort of lie unraveled now because of this judgment. Thanks, Prabhu, for being with us today. And thank you for watching.